Welcome back to the Black Track, where I do commentary and review on movies with an all-black cast, or at least a black lead. When I think about today's movie, I think about the fact that black films were so knee-deep into the gangster era in 1994 that the studio felt the need to market this movie as a comedy, which it most definitely is not. The movie in question is The Inkwell, and I remember commercials at the time presenting it as a fun-loving, teenage, coming-of-age comedy about a group of young boys living near a beach called The Inkwell which is a real place located in Martha's Vineyard. It looked like something I would want to see, but just like the rest of black America, crime movies had me in a chokehold at the time, so I didn't make it a priority to watch the movie until it hit VHS. Directed by Matty Rich, only his second film and technically final film to date, The Inkwell is a story about an awkward kid named Drew Tate, played by Lorenz Tate. Boy, they didn't really brainstorm much for that one, did they? He has some serious issues going on at home, which I'll detail more later. And to fix those issues, his family has the bright idea to take him on a trip he doesn't really want to go on, to the Inkwell, to make life more awkward, I guess. Once he gets there, he meets and interacts with what might be the biggest assortment of amazing yet underappreciated actors ever assembled for a movie. We got Joe Morton, Glenn Turman, Suzanne Douglas, Vanessa Bell Calloway, AJ Johnson, Morris Chestnut, Mary Alice, Dwayne Martin, and Jada Pinkett Smith. If I had to describe or compare the Inkwell to any other movie, I'd say it's a little bit of Crooklyn mixed in with the wood. I'll just say it's a very unique film that stands alone amongst its contemporaries, for good or for bad. So with a cast like that, why isn't the Inkwell more talked about and as celebrated as other movies from its time? Let's black track and find out. The movie begins with our main character Drew, a teenager doing what teenagers do in 1976. You know, sneaking out the house, linking up with his homie Iago. Matter of fact, they're discussing tonight's festivities as we speak. The next time, you stand home. Look, I, I don't want to hear it, okay? You can't always do the things that I want to do, you know? Oh, yapping and yelling. Yeah, so Iago is a doll that doubles as Drew's not-so-imaginary friend. I say not so imaginary because at least it's a physical object. Hey, I was always told you can talk to yourself all you want, as long as you don't answer yourself. How about we just call it an action figure so it won't be so weird? I know I gave Lorenz Tate his props before when I talked about Menace to Society and Love Jones, but I can't stress enough how great of an actor this man is. Normally, I hype up the fact that he's seemingly a vampire and can play any age he wants, even to this day. But here in The Inkwell, which is only his second film, he doesn't even have to because he was only 17 years old when it was filmed and turned 18 when it was released. I'm more impressed with the fact that he went from playing the terrifying old dog only a year prior to playing a completely different, probably on the spectrum, awkward teen like it was nothing. And once again, I stress, at only age 17. In this movie, I think he's supposed to be 16 and I want you to keep that in mind for later. Drew barely even gets in trouble for sneaking out the house. I'm assuming because his father, in his heart of hearts, just knows he's not doing anything risky enough to justify a life lesson. He know he ain't having no sex or even committing any crimes, so what would the conversation even be about? If we're keeping it real, the danger that Drew poses is actually in the house since he attempted to burn that bitch to the ground recently and it's the catalyst for the two week trip to Martha's Vineyard. Yeah, because you're gonna burn down somebody else before you burn down mine with your little pyromaniac ass. Drew's father Kenny is played by the great Joe Morton, but for me, he will forever be Miles Dyson, the guy from Terminator 2 who doomed humanity to death by creating Skynet. That alone should land you on the Harry Lennox list but you get a pass because everybody gets one. Drew's mother Brenda is played by the lovely and late Suzanne Douglas. And you wanna know something kinda ironic? In storyline, this movie takes place at Martha's Vineyard. And sadly, Suzanne Douglas passed away in 2021 at Martha's Vineyard. I just thought that was interesting. I'm telling y'all, that boy ain't right. In reality, the entire movie was filmed in North Carolina, and I don't know enough about either place to tell you if it looks authentic or not. I feel like Maddie Rich just needed a place with a beach. It didn't really matter. As soon as they get to Brenda's sister's house, what kind of movie this is becomes immediately apparent. The Inkwell aims to take about eight different black experiences and forces them to coexist for two weeks. 
You see, Kenny is a former Black Panther who sometimes still dons the guards for dramatic effect, I assume, and his sister-in-law, Frances, played by Vanessa Bell Calloway, and her husband, Spencer, played by Glenn Turman, are snobby Republican conservatives. Whew, I can't help but think that Black America would have been way more prepared for this type of conversation now than in 1994. Anyway, Spencer makes sure to throw shade at the Tate family every chance he gets, especially Kenny. But don't assume too fast that the movie wants you to think that Spencer is some kind of villain. It's more to it than that. And there's much more blatantly terrible people in this film. Like Brenda and Francis's mother, Evelyn, played by Mary Alice, who apparently hates Brenda for some reason that's not heavily explored much. You might remember Mary Alice as the Oracle in The Matrix, who replaced the original Oracle, Gloria Foster, when she passed away. Something that I like about the Inkwell is that even though Drew's weirdness is touched on in a central plot of the film, nobody really treats him any differently for it. Sure, Spencer thinks he's crazy as hell and sets him up with an appointment with a shrink, probably to get a head start on that fire insurance claim, but nobody really shuns Drew or treats him like an outcast. As a matter of fact, when it comes to his cousin Junior, played by Dwayne Martin, in the same year he did Above the Rim, he's treated like a favorite family member and one of his peers, something that sounds like it should be a given, but isn't always the case. At no point does he treat him differently or even acknowledge his weirdness, outside of a few typical teenage adolescent jokes about Drew being a virgin, and I think that's a cool thing that shows how family should overcome everything else. Plus, Dwayne Martin is supposed to be the comedy relief here, so they wasn't gonna make him out to be too heavy-handed anyway. Drew might be a virgin, but trust me, he's getting right on changing that ASAP, especially when he gets a look at neighborhood it girl Lauren Kelly, played by Jada Pinkett Smith. I don't know why I keep calling her Jada Pinkett Smith, when right here, she was just regular old Jada Pinkett. And if you're younger, I know she may have a terrible reputation now, but back during this time, Jada Pinkett was everything to young black males. She was never really at the top of my list or anything, but her cute girl next door vibe was undeniable. Interestingly, she and Lorenz Tate shared the same first and second movie, since they both starred in Menace to Society and both star in the Inkwell, which Jada did right before Jason's lyric, which is where I feel she really took off. And yeah, don't worry, I'm getting to that softcore porn of a movie real soon. They switch roles in this film, because as I stated earlier, even though Drew is an awkward teen, he's still a pretty cool and nice guy. But Lauren Kelly is a complete bitch. You're in my light. Oh, uh, 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 I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. I'm sorry. Thank you. She's one of the villains in this movie I was talking about, but I still think it's a good character because it helps show the genuineness and likability of Drew, who still wants to kick it with her despite her funky attitude. You need these type of characters for contrast and to give our main character something to overcome. Want to know something interesting that gives the Inkwell some importance in movie history? While Jada Pinkett was filming this movie, Will Smith would visit the set regularly, and that's how they first began dating each other heavily. Also, Tisha Campbell was very good friends with AJ Johnson, so she would visit the set to see her and became real close with Dwayne Martin, who she started dating and eventually married. So we kind of have the inkwell to thank for both of those relationships. Use that information any way you want when it comes to how you want to judge this movie. Honestly, Drew's coming of age story and the mystery surrounding why he set his house on fire was all this movie needed, but it only gets partial duty and has to share the screen time with the elder members of the Tate family. Now I don't really hate the story of Kenny vs Spencer, but I struggle with how it fits into the overall Drew character arc. It never ties it together, which to me is always a cardinal sin in movies because if you dedicate a bunch of time to a whole other story, then it starts to feel like you should have made a whole other movie. Regardless, it's hard to dislike it because Joe Morton and Glenn Turman are such excellent actors and I actually love their subject matter. Oh, Malcolm had no broad day support and in fact had made a lot of Negro enemies. And I suppose Reverend King didn't make any Negro enemies. Martin Luther King is another subject entirely. And besides, his assassin was white and confessed. And Malcolm's assassins were black, so what? What assassins? He was a common Harlem hoodlum, killed by common Harlem hoodlums. Spencer and Francis are basically black snobs who have made it, admittedly through hard work, and not just because they're conservatives. So they have every right to enjoy the finer things in their life. But Kenny questions their lack of compassion towards the black people who weren't afforded the same opportunities they were to make it the same way. In turn, 
Spencer challenges Kenny on what exactly the Black Panthers have done for black people, and also his minor role in the struggle, since he just made brochure copies and is a social worker. Well damn Spencer, how else are you going to get the message out? We can't all have fax machines. Of course, that comes from a complete lack of understanding about what the Black Panthers actually were. Once again, I love the back and forth that Kenny and Spencer have, and I also love the movie for trying to expose you to different black mindsets, but I also question whether it really adds anything to the movie. The bigger issue here is the fact that the constant arguing between Kenny and Spencer is putting a strain on Kenny and Brenda's marriage, and that actually does affect Drew. So I'm okay with scenes like when they went to the psychiatrist, who's played by Miss Hawkins from New Jack City. Of course, her real name is Phyllis Yvonne Stickney, and she's very Afrocentric here. Director Maddie Rich said that he wanted to put a lot of emphasis on the colors, so pretty much everybody, mostly the women, are wearing very bright colors that contrast with the usually drab backgrounds. It's one of the few ways in which the movie looks like the 70s, because otherwise, aside from the bad afro wigs, it's kind of hard to tell what time period it is. You tend to forget it's actually the 70s about halfway through the film. I really wish more movie could have been made out of Drew and his cousin linking up with the rest of his friends, because these parts are what the movie was advertised as and provide the most entertainment. Like when they go to a dance and Junior basically forces his friends to accept Drew. Or when they go to a nude beach, only to discover that it's full of old people. These moments, as well as the interactions between Junior and Drew, takes me back to a time when just knowing you was going to be in the same room with girls makes you giddy beyond all comprehension. I think my favorite scene in the whole film is when Drew gets his character arc. It can be argued that his actual arc comes later in the movie, but I think it's actually right here when we finally find out why he set fire to his house. See, Miss Hawkins is the first person to actually accept Drew's imaginary friend Iago, and when he sees that, it makes him more excited to open up and talk about himself. It turns out, he accidentally set fire to his own house when he tried to make rocket fuel, and I'm just like, <laughs> like, what, what, where were you going with that? But it makes sense when you consider that he might have Asperger's or something. Now I'm no expert on this stuff, and me personally, I don't subscribe to the theory that he's on the spectrum, but I do accept the fact that like a lot of other young black kids who may not always follow the crowd, it's sometimes hard to open up to people who don't necessarily accept you for who you are and what you like. So I love the way Miss Hawkins was able to convey that in this scene. And between getting his hair locked and breaking free of his shyness, I think this scene does more to show Drew's growth than any other scene in the movie. Which is why it sucks that following that, we get this really weird love, I guess it's a triangle, subplot between Drew, Lauren Kelly, and a woman named Heather, played by Adrian Joy Johnson, who at first I was like, who the hell is that? Until I realized that up until this point, I never knew AJ Johnson's real name was Adrian Joy. I guess I just never bothered to look it up. Drew meets Heather at a tennis court when he helps her up after a fall and recites poetry to her. There's no reason why they should ever interact with each other again, but Drew only has two weeks at this place, so he's got to increase his odds of not leaving a virgin any way he can. The best parts of this is the side story with Heather's husband Harold, played by Morris Chestnut. He's a no good philanderer, and every time he appears on camera without Heather, he's with a different woman. And I mean, he's everywhere. At the beach, in the streets, he ain't hiding a mother thing. At a certain point, it just became comedy to me, because he seems to be a very successful and well-known guy around town, but yet Heather seems to be the only person who doesn't know why he doesn't bring sand to the beach. Lauren Kelly's ex-boyfriend is dating another woman, and once she sees Drew just being himself and being nice to Heather, she gets jealous because she assumed he was a loser who couldn't get anybody else. So now this harlot wants to use poor Drew to get revenge. The reason I said that Drew's character arc came at the psychiatrist's office is because this time with Lauren Kelly, he's confident and sure of himself while also being himself, and he unexpectedly wins Lauren over by the end of the night. She even agrees to go out with him again during the upcoming bicentennial celebration. Now I'm not saying that the Heather stuff should have been completely removed because the movie needed a reason to bring Lauren and Drew together, but I am saying that they could have created a different character for the same purpose. The Heather stuff eventually devolves into silliness, with Drew using his science know-how to rig up Harold's car for revenge in a scene straight out of a Looney Tunes episode. As you can see, the tone of the movie is very uneven because for every serious scene we get, we get an equally silly scene like when Spencer assumes that Kenny can't play tennis and then loses his mind when Kenny goes Arthur Ashe on that ass. As usual, what saves this movie is how over the top everybody plays it. 
But at the same time, that makes it almost impossible to take serious what they were even arguing about. Everything ties up in a nice little bow too. Kenny and Spencer bond over the fact that Kenny isn't some common street rat and Spencer isn't some weak Uncle Tom. Then Kenny and Drew bond over the birds and the bees, comparing it to playing a good tar of all things. In fairness to Kenny, Drew did kind of put him on the spot. Okay, what's the clitoris? With his instrument properly tuned, Drew sets out for his date with Lauren Kelly, but something is amiss. I don't remember the tapes mentioning that they were Jehovah's Witnesses, but for some reason, Lauren sure seems to be avoiding answering the door. Poor Drew, man. He sits there what appears to be for hours until it gets dark when suddenly a light comes on and Lauren is in her room entangled with her ex-boyfriend. This scene always confused me for multiple reasons because what was the scenario? Did Lauren and dude sneak in through the back door to avoid Drew? Were they in the house the entire time and just moved to the bedroom when they thought he was gone? And if they were in the bedroom the entire time, why turn the lights back on for back shots? None of those options make sense when you see Lauren's expression when she notices Drew because she had no idea he was even there. Most people consider this Drew's arc, but I think he already was who he was going to be before this. He had already gained the confidence he needed. And what happens next? almost derails all of that. When I first saw this movie years ago, I wasn't really expecting the Inkwell to move into controversial territory, but the next set of events has been often discussed and debated over whether it's even controversial as it appears. If you've never seen it, you can decide for yourself. Heather finally catches Harold in the act, in the most innocuous way possible, just by finding a bottle of wine in his bag. I thought that should have been a little more egregious than that, but that's neither here nor there. Harold storms out of the house and Heather decides to cry it out at the Inkwell Beach, just as Drew shows up with a similar idea. With them both going through traumatic experiences, they bond over their pain and Heather learns that Drew was the one who bugs bunnied up Harold's car. As a reward, Drew gets a kiss and then some. They even get fireworks. Now this seems innocent enough, right? Drew gets to lose his virginity to somebody he built up a nice little friendship with during the movie. But remember, I told you to keep Lorenz Tate age in the back of your mind. And let me remind you that he's 17 years old, possibly 18, but I'm almost certain 17 during the filming of this movie. And AJ Johnson? Well, you probably couldn't tell by looking at her because black show enough don't crack, but she's 31 right here. And director Maddie Rich had the nerve to tell her to act older. Uh, so be herself then? But let's say for conversation that Lorenz is 18 here. Well, the character is supposed to be 16, so it doesn't really make it any less weirder. For me, it undermines almost everything about the character. He didn't even need to have sex right here. The only reason he even wanted to was because his cousin was pressuring him. Perhaps I mistakenly thought him being different was about subverting the norms of what was expected of him and finding other ways to relate to women. And maybe my nitpicking is pointless since the director says he purposely left it up in the air whether they actually had sex or not. So like I said, it's up to you whether you feel it's controversial or not. I do like the look they give each other at the end though because they know they're not going to see each other again. And I also like that Drew decides he's not going to tell his cousin what happened and with who, preserving the reputation of Heather and still leaving what happened up in the air. But wait a minute. It seems like Junior was the real version all along because he's running after this car for details like he doesn't have a clue. Maybe it was about him living through Drew this entire time. Let's get to the grade. The Inkwell was an interesting concept. Take a bunch of different types of black people from different backgrounds with wildly different personalities and make them interact with each other on a small island. I can't help but feel like that should have been the entire premise and it shouldn't have had a main character at all. It should have been about everybody instead of just one. Since they decided to make it from the point of view of just one guy, you have to take everything you see on screen into account as it pertains to his story. As a whole, I really like Drew's journey. It's interesting to me that all throughout the movie, everybody tried to make Drew out to be the crazy one with all the problems, but in the end, everybody around Drew were the ones with the problems and the trauma and he ironically ended up being the most normal one out of everybody. Just misunderstood. I think that was the point. You have to clean your own house before you can judge somebody else's. The Inkwell is a movie about preconceived beliefs. Nearly everyone in the film is assumed to be one way, but turn out to be the complete opposite, or not nearly as bad. 
More emphasis should have been placed on the idea that it was Drew who was making everybody else a better person. I also think Drew becoming a man shouldn't have hinged on him having sex. Like I said, he was already on his way to becoming a man through his prior actions. Overall though, I've always liked the Inkwell for what it was, especially coming from a 21 year old second time director. And I applaud it not only for coming out during a crowded era for black movies, but for having the courage to present a movie with black families, successful black people, non-violent black people, and diverse black people. For that alone, the Inkwell holds a special place in the history of black cinema. My grade for the Inkwell is a C+. The movie has always given off the vibe that it could probably be retooled into something much better. And that's it for this episode of The Black Track. Do you think the ending to the Inkwell is as controversial as people make it out to be? Let me know in the comments below. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and tell your friends about my channel. And until next time, I'll holla at you.